Wouldn't it be wonderful if some great person said to you, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? What would your answer be? Wouldn't it even be more exciting if God said, what do you want me to do for you? What would be your answer? Well, actually, in the Bible, there are several passages where a question like that has been asked. We can see in the book of 2 Kings, a little further than we're going to look at today, Elisha went to a woman called the Shunammite, and she'd been careful to take care of him. And so Elisha says to her, you've been careful for us with all care. What can I do for you? What can I do for you? That's what Elisha asked her. She said, well, I live among my own people. And then Elisha found out she had no son. And he said, next year you will embrace a son. And that's what happened. God provided her a son through the ministry of Elisha. In the book of Esther, we see kind of a similar question. Two different times, King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, What is your petition? For it shall be granted to you. And what is your request? Even to half of the kingdom, it shall be done. And she requested for her life. And she requested for the life of her people. And it was done. And God saved them. A great question was asked and a great answer was given. In our passage this morning, I want you to look for that particular question because in that particular question, Elijah is about to be taken. And Elisha, who's been his faithful servant for years, is going to be asked that question. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 2 as we continue on. If you remember, Elijah's the great prophet that appeared on the scene. Elijah's the one who said there will be no rain, and there was no rain. Elijah's the one who called down fire from heaven to consume the sacrifice of God. Elijah's the one who called for rain, and there was rain. Elijah's the one who called down fire from heaven against the enemies of God. Elijah's this great prophet who had pronounced judgment on Ahab on several occasions. And now he's near the end of his life. Elisha. We were introduced to in 1 Kings chapter 19 when Elijah was so discouraged and Elijah said, I've been very zealous for the Lord and the sons of Israel have torn down your altars and I alone am left. God said, that's not really true. There's 7,000 left. And he says, but you go ahead and anoint Elisha to be prophet in your place. And that's what happened. And Elisha then served Elijah for several years, many years, really until We come to our passage today, and Elisha continues to serve him. And we read in verse 1, And it came about when the Lord was about to take up Elijah by a whirlwind to heaven, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. So it tells us that God is going to take Elijah, and he's going to take him in a manner that only two people have gone to heaven without dying And this is the setting of our passage. And Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. So we see that Elisha is resolute to follow Elijah, and he continues to be faithful, and he continues to serve him. And why won't he go? Why won't he stay by himself? And it seems, and we don't know for sure, but if you think about in the history of the nation, when Moses was about to die, he blessed the nation. When Jacob was about to die, he blessed his sons. And Elisha is a prophet also, and he knows something big is going to happen, and he wants to stay with Elijah. And so he says, I will not leave. So they went down to Bethel about eight miles. Then the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came to Elisha and said to him, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he said, yes, I know. Be still. So God had revealed it to the sons of the prophets. God had revealed it to Elisha also. And so Elisha says, I know, but be still. He's going to stay with Elijah. 
And I think it's encouraging to see that there are sons of the prophets because remember Elijah in his discouragement had said, I am alone and left. But evidently there was a number of prophets who've been raised up or at least sons of the prophets, probably some sort of a a discipleship school or, or, or group of people. And so they're there now at this time. In verse 4, Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. So they came about 15 more miles, and Elisha just sticks with him. The sons of the prophets who were at Jericho approached Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be still. So you see, Elisha knows. The sons of the prophets know. And Elisha is committed to stay with Elijah. Then Elijah said to him, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. And that would be another five miles perhaps. Now fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood opposite them at at a distance while the two of them stood by the Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle. And a mantle is like an outer robe. It could be maybe a scarf. It could be some, maybe a shawl, something like that. But it seems that it was symbolic of the office of prophet. Now remember we'd read earlier that Elijah wore a, a hairy robe and it said he had a leather girdle. But it seems though that this mantle is important because if we read back in chapter 19 of 1 Kings when Elijah called Elisha and he was to anoint him, he threw his mantle on him. So in a sense, we see that it was God's choice that Elisha was to be the successor even then. But we see, though, as things unfold, that Elijah still is the lead prophet. And he takes his mantle, and it says in verse 8, and he folded it together, and he struck the waters, and they were divided here and there so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. So we see that he departed the waters of the Jordan River, Now, you know, not a lot of people do that. Now, Moses parted the Red Sea, and Joshua, when he came into the land, he parted the Jordan. But other than that, I don't know of any others that did. But now Elijah does it. And so, Elijah here, this is the mark, I would say, of the prophet. And he struck the waters, and they were divided here and there, so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground, And when they had crossed over, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And do you see here that Elijah also knows that he's going to be taken that day. Now, I'm not sure he knows exactly how, but he knows. And Elisha also knew, and the prophets knew. But this is the first time Elijah is revealing this to Elijah. Elijah is revealing it to Elisha. Ask what I shall do for you. Now, Elijah was the great prophet, and here he's got this opportunity. He's asked this great question, what shall I do for you? What would his answer be? And Elisha said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. Interesting answer, isn't it? A double portion of your spirit. What exactly does that mean? Does that mean that you're going to be twice the prophet I am? I don't really think so. Uh, Though Elisha was a great prophet, does it mean that he's going to do twice the miracles that Elijah did? Well, actually, as you read through the text, he did do twice as many miracles as Elijah did. So that's a possibility. But when he says he wants to have a double portion... That reminds me of a passage in Deuteronomy 21 where the firstborn son would receive a double portion and that would be that he was the heir or he was the new head of the family. And I think what Elisha is asking for is that he would be the successor of Elijah. That Elijah was the head of the family of God in a sense on earth, the prophet of the northern kingdom and he wants to be that spiritual successor to carry on the ministry of Elijah. And that's what he asked for. 
It's interesting in chapter 1 Kings 1, 19, that's what God had already determined would happen. But we see God had chosen him for that position, but we also see that he himself is zealous for that position. That's what he wants. I think he has a spiritual zeal. We might say a holy ambition, a sanctified pursuit. That's what he asked for. And Elijah says, you have asked for a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. Interesting to look at divine sovereignty and election that he was chosen. Look at his own responsibility that he desired it. And look at the fact that it seems to be there's a test that he has to be faithful. He has to stay with him because that's the condition for him to receive his request. In verse 11, and they were going along and talking. Behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire which separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind to heaven. There's only two people that went to heaven without dying. And now Elijah joins that company. And that's Enoch and now Elijah. And of course, Elijah, the great prophet who will be with Moses and with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. But at this point, we see that Elijah is translated or taken to heaven. And it says there was a chariot of fire and horses of fire. And, and exactly what that is, I'm not quite sure, to be honest. Uh, it, it probably has some angelic reference there. Chariot of fire, horses of fire, which separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind to heaven. And Elisha saw it and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. Now, it says in the previous verse, the chariot separated them. And it only mentioned one chariot. In the next verse, it mentions chariots plural and then it says horsemen the previous verse didn't say that so who's the horseman and what's the other chariot and again I'm not sure we know all the details but it could it be that Elijah himself mounted the chariot and God took him up in a chariot of fire in the whirlwind and I believe something of that nature is the answer to that particular understanding or, or question about the verse and Elisha saw it, and he sees Elijah ascend to heaven. And then it says he saw Elijah no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes, and he tore them in two pieces. And that would be a sign of, of, of grief, that he'd lost his mentor, his spiritual father. He also took up the mantle of Elijah. And I think that's more than just picked up his robe because there's a symbolism there in other words when he was anointed back in chapter 19 Elijah threw his mantle to him but then Elijah continued to wear the mantle and then he wanted to be the successor the double portion and then we see he faithfully persevered to receive that blessing and now he is taking up I think that mantle which symbolizes that position of prophet and leader of the spiritual nation of Israel at that time. He took up the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and returned and stood by the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and struck the waters and said, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? He wasn't asking the question because he didn't know the answer. But I think what he's saying here is he's calling upon God to minister through him just as he had ministered through Elijah. And what does it say? And when he also had struck the waters, they were divided here and there, and Elisha crossed over. We see he's now entering pretty select company. We see Moses parted the Red Sea. We see Joshua led Israel through the Jordan. We see Elijah parted the Jordan. And now we see Elisha parts the Jordan as well. He's the successor. He's taken up the mantle of Elijah. And now I think God has validated him as the leader of the nation, or at least the people of God in the nation. He took up the mantle. He struck the waters. 
and the waters parted. It says he struck them, and it says here he called upon God and he crossed over. Now in verse 15, now when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho opposite him saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah rest on Elisha. In other words, I think what he had asked for, he has received, and all can see it, and he is recognized as this great prophet himself. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him, and they said to him, Behold now, there are with your servants fifty strong men. Please let them go and search for your master. Perhaps the Spirit of the Lord has taken him up and cast him on some mountain or into some valley. And he said, You shall not send. But when they urged him until he was ashamed, he said, send. They sent therefore 50 men and they searched three days but did not find him. They returned to him while he was staying at Jericho and he said to them, did I not not say to you, do not go? In other words, Elisha knew that Elijah had been taken to heaven. So there's no need to go send for Elijah. He's not here. But they continued to persist. Oh, he says, go ahead. But he said, I told you, you didn't need to do that. I said, do not go. It's interesting the question that Elisha asked, where is the God of Elijah? Because Elijah was gone. But the God of Elijah was not gone. He was right there. And he said, where is the God of Elijah? And Elijah's God was right there. And he parted the waters and he continued to be there for the nation of Israel through the ministry of Elisha. There's several other miracles in the rest of this chapter that continue to validate Elisha as the successor. But I'd like us to ask ourselves the question, what's the significance of the passage for us? Well, from a historical standpoint, I think it's transitional. It's transitional and it shows that the ministry of Elijah continued on in the ministry of Elisha. And even though the northern kingdom, for the most part, had departed from God, God had not departed from them. And God continued to work through them and to them through the prophets. And some would respond. And so I think from a historical standpoint, I think we can see that. From more of a personal standpoint, what can we see from the passage? And I think as we look at Elisha, I mean, we can look at it from different angles, but from the perspective of Elisha, what was key for Elisha? And I think it was his steadfastness. We see back in 1 Kings 19 that he was to be the successor, but then he served for many years and was faithful to Elijah. He was faithful to him and he served him and was trustworthy for years. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, Moreover, it is required of a steward that he be found faithful, that he be found trustworthy. And so what do we see here? That Elisha was a faithful man. And as that, he's a model for us to be faithful, to be trustworthy. That's what he was. But more than that, though, what can we see? Well, our first question was, what, what would you think if a great man said, what can I do for you? And if that great, great man were a prophet of God, wouldn't that be even greater? And that's exactly what happened. Because what did Elijah say to Elisha? He said to him, what shall I do for you? Now, what was Elisha's response? He didn't ask for money. He didn't ask for fame. He asked for a double portion of the spirit of Elijah. I think he wanted to be the successor. And I think he probably saw in Elijah a reality and a spiritual life and a zeal for God that he wanted even more for himself. And Elisha was no mean man to begin with, but he was asking for more and he wanted to be following in the train in the footsteps of Elijah. And he asked for spiritual power and enablement. Far from some false name it, claim it theology. I'm not preaching that at all. But I am saying here, there's a desire for spiritual growth and power. And that's what he asked for. Now, you say to yourself, well, I'm not Elisha and I don't know anybody named Elijah. 
And, well, maybe you know somebody named Elijah, but I'm not sure he's the prophet. And then you say, and you know, I'm not Queen Esther, and I don't know King Ahasuerus, and I'm not the Shunammite, and I don't know Elisha. I mean, John, this is great, but what about me? Well, are there lessons for us in this passage? I think there are, because in the New Testament, there are passages that are somewhat similar to this. In other words, the two great things I see in Elisha are faithfulness and this holy ambition where he asks for enablement and endowment with the Spirit. And there's a verse in James that says, you have not because you ask not. Is it possible that we could be challenged to ask, to be useful to God, to say, God, I want to be filled with your Spirit. I want to be controlled by your Spirit. What would you say if some great person, some prophet said, what do you want me to do for you? Could you say, I want to be filled with the Spirit. You know, there's another verse in John chapter 16 and verse 24. Jesus says, until now you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be made full. Sounds to me like he's saying, you need to ask. You need to ask for spiritual I would say blessings and enablement and what you ask and what I ask might be different, but I would say don't we all want to say, I want to be filled with the Spirit. I want to glorify God in my life. That's something I think the Bible would say, ask. There's another passage that I think is even more parallel in the Gospel of Luke. In Luke chapter 11, the disciples came to Jesus and they said, Lord, teach us to pray. And Jesus taught him what we call the Lord's Prayer. It was really the disciples' prayer. And then afterwards, Jesus is encouraging them. And listen to what he says. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Doesn't that seem like Elisha? Elisha says, I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying with you. I'll go from Gilgal. I'll go to Bethel. I'll go to Jericho. I'll go to the Jordan. I'm going to stay with you because I want to ask that big question or I want to answer the big question when you ask it. And here Jesus says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Boy, that sounds a little bit like Elisha, doesn't it? I want a double portion of your spirit. Now, Matthew's gospel says, I will give good things to those who ask. And certainly both are true. But do you see the spiritual desire to grow that Elisha, it seems to me, has? Or at least the spiritual desire to minister. I think it's all there. That's what he wants. But he asks. But, you know, that's not the only passage either. You remember that Samaritan woman? We talk about her sometimes. I just love that passage. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. She says, how is it that you being a Jew ask me for a drink since I'm a Samaritan woman for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans? And what did Jesus say to her? If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would give you living water. What's the living water? Well, in the Gospel of John, it's the Holy Spirit. It's the forgiveness of sins. It's eternal life. And he says, if you want that Holy Spirit, if you want that forgiveness and eternal life, you need to know who I am. You need to know what the gift of God is, and you need to ask. And if you do, he'll give it to you. You know, there's one other passage that I think is pretty parallel here, too. In the Gospel of Luke, in Luke chapter 18, remember Jesus was going to Jericho. And as he was going into the city, there was a blind man sitting by the side of the road begging. And he says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who led the way were sternly telling him to be quiet. And then he says, son of David, have mercy on me. 
And Jesus stopped and commanded that he be brought to him. And when he came near, he questioned him. Listen to what Jesus' question was. What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? That's not Elijah asking. That's not Elisha asking. That's not Ahasuerus asking. That's God the Son asking. What do you want me to do for you? And what does the blind man say? He says, Lord, I want to regain my sight. And what did Jesus say? He says, receive your sight. Your faith has saved you. Five times in the Gospel of Luke, it uses that phrase, your faith has saved you. And I think it's a picture not only of receiving sight, but receiving eternal life and the forgiveness of sins. And he says, what do you want me to do for you? And how is it that God can do such a great thing that he can regain his sight? And not only that, that he can be forgiven and have eternal life. How is it that God can do that? Because Jesus does the work. And he did the work on the cross when he died in our place and when he shed his blood to pay the penalty for sins. It says without shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. But it also says the blood of Jesus his son cleanseth us from all sin. And Jesus died in our place and paid the penalty and he did the work. And that enables him to ask the question, what do you want me to do for you? And so our question isn't so far-fetched, is it? If a great man asked you, what do you want me to do for you? What would you ask or what would you answer? What if Jesus, God the Son, asked you that question? What would your answer be? Well, if you're a Christian, it may vary. All of us have different needs. But could we all agree, wouldn't it be a great answer to say, Lord, I want to be filled with the Spirit. I want to glorify you. I want to be fruitful in my life. Wouldn't that be a great answer? And that sure sounds quite a bit like Elisha's request. I want to have a double portion of your spirit. And it sounds a lot like Luke where he says, ask, seek, and knock. God gives the spirit to those who do that. The enablement of the spirit. All Christians have the spirit, but are we controlled by the spirit? Are we filled by the spirit? I think that's the encouragement of the passage. And if you've never trusted in Christ, what would your answer be? Well, he said to that Samaritan woman, if you knew the gift of God, that's eternal life, and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, that's me, Jesus, God the Son, you would ask, you would have asked, and he would have given you living water, forgiveness, eternal life, justification, salvation, if you ask. And how do you ask? You believe. You believe in who he is. And you say, God, I want to be forgiven. I trust that Jesus died for me. And when you do that, receive your sight. Your faith has saved you. Receive your life. Receive eternal life. Faith has saved you. Because Jesus did the work. Let's pray. Lord, we think of the old hymn, What can take away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. But Lord, we thank you that blood was shed. The price was paid. And if there's one who is not sure they're forgiven, I'd like to speak as a servant of Jesus Christ and say, what do you want me to do for you? And my friend, if your answer is, I want to be forgiven, then pray with me. Dear God, I want to be forgiven. I want to have the promise of eternal life. I believe that Jesus is God the Son. I believe He died in my place. I believe He paid my penalty. I believe He shed His blood to deliver me from a hell forever. I trust Him is my Savior. Thank you for the free gift of eternal life. And my Christian friend, 
If God were to say, what do you want me to do for you? May we say, I want to be filled with the Spirit. I want to glorify you. I want to walk with you. Help me. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.